Mark, what a pleasure to have you here today, buddy. Uh, really Thanks. appreciate you coming here and being part of our summit and looking forward to your topic, the dollar super cycle and the end of economic primacy. So take it away, brother. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Dale. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. You know, I got a chance a little bit to work with uh, your team, Joe and Steve, and uh, I'm very impressed. We've got a really first rate team. And so I look forward to this. And uh, thanks a lot for all the help uh, in setting this up. Uh, okay. Maybe the first place to begin, though, before I share my screen, is to really uh, just talk about methodology. Because I spent most of my career on the institutional side. I began my career really on the retail side. That's when we met, I think, they on the floor of the exchange. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I spent most of my career really uh, working with institutional investors, uh, largest asset managers, large companies. And I think there's a, really a difference between uh, institutional and retail. And I think that what I've tried to do with... Uh, by being on the social media, especially to make my blog accessible, is really trying to democratize or help democratize the markets in a sense of bringing institutional knowledge, institutional ways of thinking about things into uh, the retail space. I have a lot of respect for people who are using their own money, not just uh, what I've done in my career, helping other people trade their money, uh, but really uh, the people who, a lot, of your, a lot of your viewers, a lot of people on the webinar today, using their own money having their own skin in the game to trade and live on their own wits. So I have a lot of respect for that, and that's why I try to help bring these institutional ideas. I think the, uh, maybe the first place to begin is uh, a lot of us use uh, linear approaches to things, linear relationship between variables. And as I'll show you shortly, I think that things are much more cyclical, and especially when we've been talking about the big dollar cycle. So even though I'm a macro, I focus on the macroeconomics, I have a lot of respect for the price action because this is, I think, that uh, the fundamentals don't change as often as the prices do. And the key to making money in the markets is not so much getting it right as really being prudent risk managers. As a, as a head of strategy for different banks over my career, I often uh, people come to me with trade ideas. And a, a person who's relatively uh, new to the game will come to me and say uh, that they have a trade idea, they can make a million dollars. Someone who's more experienced, who perhaps has more scar tissue, would come to me and say, listen, I have a trade idea, and if I'm wrong, we lose $200,000. One is focusing on the downside, the risk management, and the other focuses on the upside and the, uh, sort of the glory, the hitting, uh, hitting the home run or something like that. So I, find tech I use technicals to help uh, assess and manage risk, because I think that in trading, what I often see is uh, uh, traders, when you look at their track records, make a little money, make a little money, make a little money, lose a lot of money. And so to avoid that, I find the technicals are helpful, even if one does not really believe in the uh, numerology involved and the uh, Fibonacci retracements and uh, uh, other, other technical schools. It's the only thing that we can control, right, Mark? I, I think so. I mean, I, I think that it's sort of like in poker, you know, they say you, you can't really pick the cards you're dealt. You can just you just have to play with what you have. And so, uh, uh, so maybe, maybe I should show you uh, this first chart. I think it gets to some of the issues that uh, um, previous uh, Mark was talking about. Uh, here is, uh, I think this is the only picture of the dollar that really matters from a policy-making point of view. And what I will show you shortly, though, is, uh, so this is really, uh, let me just define this for you. This is the real trade-weighted measure of the dollar index. This is not the dollar index that we trade. That dollar index that we trade is not really a dollar index. It's mostly the dollar against a bunch of European currencies. I helped launch that and market for that, uh, that uh, dollar index when it was first launched. It's a nice trading vehicle, but it has nothing to do with the real world. For example, our biggest trading partners like Mexico and China are not even in that dollar index. This is what the Federal Reserve uses. This is real, meaning it's adjusted for inflation. It's broad, meaning it includes a lot of U.S. trading partners. And what I brought this chart back to uh, sort of the beginning of the modern era, which is when we got off the Brenton Woods system. So that's in 1971. And you can see on this chart that there's been three big dollar rallies we've had since the end of Brenton Woods. The idea that the dollar is in a big, down, in a big downward trend since Brenton Woods is just, is just not true. This chart illustrates the fact that we've had three dollar rallies since the end of Brenton Woods. This first big dollar rally here 
this is the this is the uh, Reagan dollar rally. This is Reagan and Volcker. This is the raising of interest rates by 100 basis points overnight when Carter was still president. And we had the policy mix under Reagan and Volcker of loose fiscal policy. Again, the, under Reagan, we had tax cuts, military and social spending increases, loose fiscal policy, tight monetary policy, because remember, we had double digit inflation and Volcker squeezing that inflation out by raising interest rates despite the rise in unemployment. That policy mix, I look for that policy mix. That's another important point about methodology. I look for that policy mix. Tight monetary, loose fiscal policy, and that policy mix often coincides with a currency rally. That's not a Reagan-Volker, but we'll come back to that with uh, the more recent dollar rally. That's what Germany had when their Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the, uh, the government had loose fiscal policy, right? There was a leveraged buyout of East Germany. The Bundesbank didn't like it, stepped on the monetary break. Euro, the Deutsche Mark at the time shot up. What's interesting here about this dollar rally is that it ended, it ended in uh, the sort of the official end, not just the peak of it. What happened was that the official peak is in, is in, is in uh, February, but what officials did, it was still too high in September 1985. This is the Plaza Agreement that basically triggers the intervention coordinated intervention among the G5 countries. Canada and Italy weren't invited. And that set us up for a bear market for the dollar, a 10-year bear market for the dollar. And then we had the next dollar rally. Uh, I call it the Clinton-Rubin dollar rally because this dollar rally was partly the tech bubble. I mean, remember when Netscape, the first search engine, went public? Imagine the internet without a search engine. It's like a, a dictionary that's not alphabetized. So we had people wanting to buy U.S. stocks and Americans keeping our money at home. But the key to this was the change of the Treasury Secretary. Besides having this rule of thumb about monetary and fiscal policy mix, I have another rule of thumb. I said if anybody close to Texas gets charge of the dollar, it sells off. John Connolly, who was in a car with John F. Kennedy as a Democrat when Kennedy gets shot in Texas, he becomes a Republican, and he is Nixon's Treasury Secretary when we go off to Bretton Woods. We decouple from that, the last, like the last severing of it, Connolly from Texas, Treasury Secretary. James Baker was Treasury Secretary from Texas in the Plaza Agreement, driving the dollar down. And here, the last part of this dollar sell-off, this cycle, was when Lloyd Benson was at the Treasury and he also used the dollar as a weapon, threatening Japan to let the dollar fall if they did not make some trade concession. What, what this dollar rally, Clinton-Rubin dollar rally is based on is when Lloyd Benson was replaced by Robert Rubin. Robert Rubin said a strong dollar was in US interest. What does this mean? You know, We have a vice president of the United States that once said that a strong dollar meant it was difficult to counterfeit. That's not at all what Rubin meant. Rubin meant that, that up until then, the U.S. was willing to use the dollar as a weapon. Benson used it, Baker used it, and in here we use it several times as well. In fact, some people think that 87 slide, that the stock market fell by 25% in one day, was partly predicated on comments about, from uh, Treasury Secretary Baker uh, threatening the Germans uh, with a deep dollar devaluation, setting us up for that 87 crash. But in any event, when, what Robert Rubin meant was that the U.S. would not use the dollar as a weapon to either promote exports or to devalue our debt. If the dollar fell by market forces, so be it. But the U.S. would not purposely drive it so, de-weaponizing it. And this is what paved the ground for this, the Clinton-Rubin dollar rally. Again, this rally, it, it's not just a downtrend, but this, is a, this was a big trend, lasted many years. And then in October of 2000, Lawrence Summers had replaced Rubin as Treasury Secretary. And, you know, in this time, as the dollar is rallying, and the reason it's rallying again is because Americans are buying, keeping our money at home, and foreign investors could not wait to buy U.S. equities. Uh, you know, this was the explosion. I had one account I'd set up for my son. I called it my Wintel account. I only bought uh, Microsoft and Intel in it. 
This is as we are carving out replacing computers, excuse me, we are replacing typewriters with computers. This is the carving out of the space. And so uh, uh, we have this big dollar rally, but in the middle of it, sort of towards the end of it, the euro was born. And when the euro was born at about 119, it proceeds to fall to about 82 and a half cents. Europe thinks we're picking on it. They did not want a weaker dollar, despite, excuse me, they didn't want a weaker currency. This is despite this idea that there's a, that central banks or countries always want a weaker currency. It's just not true. Here, at the top of the Reagan uh, Volcker dollar rally, Europe and Japan wanted to stop the dollar from rallying. They wanted to stop their currencies from falling. Same thing here, the Clinton Rubin dollar rally. Europe wanted, did not want the euro to fall any further. They helped organize G7 intervention. The U.S. participated in it and participated Plaza in the Accord intervention. Mark? Excuse me? Was that the Plaza Accord right there? No. The Plaza that Accord is, is okay. 85. This okay. is another one. We don't talk that much about it, but in October 2000, the, uh, the major central banks intervened again at Europe's request to support the euro. That is, they bought the euro, sold dollars. And that set us up for another long downtrend in the dollar. Now, my book came out in uh, my first book came out in '09 uh, in a February, excuse me, in August of '09. So I'm sorry, August of '09 in here someplace. Uh, here we go. Uh, I had thought that the dollar was going to be in the middle of another big dollar rally because a lot of people were telling me that the dollar could not rally, that there was structurally structural problems, and that's another methodological point. When I hear people confusing cyclical forces and thinking that they're structural forces, like right now, people think the dollar is only can go up. And they've got all these reasons why. I read one reason recently that they said the Fed's balance sheet is going to cause a dollar to fall. The Fed's balance sheet is about 30% of GDP. The ECB's balance sheet is about 40% of GDP. The Bank of Japan's balance sheet is over 100% of GDP. But somehow, the dollar is going to be dragged down by the Fed's balance sheet. So the, the point here, I think, is that for me is that I had anticipated this big dollar rally. And now I'm thinking that the third big dollar rally since the end of Brent Woods is over, or nearly so. The crisis has put like a little spanner in the works, perhaps. But you know, at the end of last year, three or four months at the end of 2019, this broad-weighted measure of the dollar fell. I, Bloomberg hadn't updated since the end of the year. We know that it's really fallen in the first three months of, of this year. And it has also fallen at the end of last year. So I thought that a good case can be made for it rolling over. And why would the dollar roll over? Well, I thought of three reasons that I saw. One is the policy mix was no longer as favorable. Remember, this is the, I should just back up a little bit and say, talk a little about this uh, Obama, a Trump dollar rally. And at first it was divergence. The U.S. In, first in, first out of the great, of the great uh, recession, the great financial crisis. And then latter part of it was again, with the, as we saw with the Reagan, the policy mix. Federal Reserve was tightening monetary policy and the government was spending money. So fiscal stimulus, monetary tightening, give us this Obama Trump dollar rally, which I think is rolling over here. And so the reason I think it's rolling over, policy mix has changed. It's no longer supportive for the dollar. Secondly, what I find interesting is that, again, this gets to the methodological point about cycles. You would think that interest rate differentials have moved in the U.S.'s favor, but they really haven't. The U.S. interest rates, and I'm looking at the two-year interest rate differentials, have really fallen since the end of 2018. So the dollar is losing its interest rate support. And you know, most recently, of course, interest rates are converging close to zero. That is, ECB, Swiss National Bank, Bank of Japan have negative interest rates, but they have not cut them any further during this crisis. Instead, they've used other tools, but it's the other countries like the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, have been cutting interest rates. So you have a, a convergence of interest rates, and that also undermines the dollar. And thirdly, I think this is one area where I think Trump is right about the dollar, and almost no matter what metric you want to look at, is very overvalued. I'll give you an example. The euro, so I, how do we measure overvaluation in currencies? I think one way economists have come up with is purchasing power parity. And I know everybody's familiar with the Big Mac or uh, 
cappuccinos at Starbucks and looking at them over, over uh, different countries. The OECD has a model. I use that just because it's handy. And that model suggests that OECD currencies don't really get 20% beyond 20% or 25% beyond fair value. The euro is stretching that now. And other, cur other currencies are as well, but that's sort of the, the, uh, the big example for you. But I wanted to show you, before I leave this completely, is to show you another screen if I can. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I might need some help. You got it. It's right there. Uh, yep. Yeah, so I'm looking for this other screen here for you. Hey, Mark. Uh, if you um, if you click on the share screen button yeah. again, which it should now uh, be at the top of your screen, because uh, now that you're sharing your screen, the um, uh, Zoom panel is going to be at the top of your screen, and w once you mouse over it, it's going to expand. So once you yes. click again on the share screen, it's going to give you the option to change the screen you're sharing. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, so here you go. See that? Yes. Yeah. The new screen. Yep. So you see that this yellow line over this I've put is this is the euro. And I took the inverse of the euro. So I took the euro and did the opposite. So rather than having how many dollars of the euro buy, I look at how many euros a dollar buys. And you can see over this how well the how well the broad trade weighted dollar and the euro track each other. So for me, focusing on that broad trade weighted dollar is the real anchor. And then the euro, which of course is what we can trade, we can't trade that real broad traded weighted dollar, but that is the, uh, I, that's where I get the, the major uh, thrust from, from my dollar views. Okay. I, th I thought maybe, uh, uh, maybe I should show you a couple of things of, uh, that I'm, I'm looking at like right now. Uh, for like some actionable things. And so again, I'm going to try to uh, uh, share another screen with you. And this is uh, this is the Australian dollar. And you know, uh, uh, you can see that, yeah? Yes. Yep. So you can see what, what, a, what an incredible recovery we've had there on the Australian dollar. And my work, again, combined technicals and fundamentals suggests to me a couple of things. One is that we're already beyond those Fibonacci retracements. That came in at, came in at these old highs uh, near 64.50. Well beyond that now. And I'm looking at a place to sell it. So what I'm looking for then is a reversal, something in the price action to tell me that a high is at hand or that a reversal pattern is actually unfolding. It does not exist yet. But I'm anticipating it by early next week because early next week, the Reserve Bank of Australia meets. And I don't think they're going to be very happy with the appreciation of the Australian dollar given the weakness of the economy and the terms of trade shock. And again, the terms of trade shock uh, <clears throat> really refers to the, what they're exporting relative to what they're importing. And I know that trade is falling, but trade is still a very important factor. And I, I just point out this, that I think that the uh, Australian Typically, a central bank wants a currency to go in the same direction as monetary policy. So when the central bank is tightening, they want a stronger currency. They're easing now. The RBA has been easing, has eased very aggressively. They are the first country besides Japan to try yield curve control. The yield curve control means they're targeting another rate besides the overnight rate. What they're doing is they're targeting the three-year yield, the three-year bond yield at 25 basis points, which is the same as the overnight interest rate. That is steeping the yield curve. Okay. And the strengthening of the Australian dollar offsets that easing. And so I think they will see a more, uh, a stronger warning uh, or pushback from the RBA next week. And that's just probably in time for the Aussie to be peaking. This yellow line I put in there is the 200 a moving average. And so ideally, I'm looking, so sort of like a scientist, like those people who found the DNA, they sort of knew what they were looking for and that helped them find it. You got it, it's a very, uh, a very delicate balance. So I am looking for a reversal pattern here. Now I wanna have one, just show you one more chart. I just uh, wanna ask you something on that Aussie, Mark. Sure. So uh, this recent rally, since it carried past a lot of fibs and even though you're looking for, um, 
uh, Bank of Australia not to be happy and a correction could ensue, maybe back to 62 cents or yeah. 60. Are you just looking for this pullback to be corrective? And is the possibility there viable that the lows we made on the crash are the lows for quite some time in the Aussie? Yeah, no, that's, that's my thinking, Dale, is that that Aussie, okay. when we were down here, this is just like unreasonably, I mean, this was just, a, this is the market's panicking. This is the market's pricing in that big tail risk, that left-hand tail risk. The world was coming to an end. Locusts were swarming Africa. We were hit with a virus. And I know, uh, I, I heard uh, 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 Mark's comments about the pandemic and how we might have overreacted. And I just, I, I think that, again, is, is, is not borne out by the facts. I think that the, uh, the fact of the matter is this, that you look at death rates and you look at like New York's average deaths or the country's average deaths, this is, this is the big one. This is not just, uh, what do you call it? A, a garden variety recession. This is, this is the big one. This is, this is the biggest uh, pandemic of our lives. Uh, it's not just that the US overreacted, Almost every country had the same response. And what's going to happen, and this is really the telling thing, is, you know, the, uh, the idea that uh, tomorrow or whenever the government says, okay, now you can go out. Look what's happened where people have allowed to go out. They do not have, uh, the social trust has not come back. They are reluctant to do public transportation. They're reluctant to go to big restaurants. They're reluctant to have big sporting events. This is a big, this is, I think, uh, a big deal. And I, 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 I want to say that the, the markets are pricing in the end of the world, not just in this, not just in the Aussie, but you see this in almost every risk asset. Yeah. And even now they're pricing assets. in, we could flip a light switch and everything's okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Let no, me I ask agree. you this, Mark, um, in the depression in the thirties, and this is not my thought. It comes from Danielle DiMartino that it took three years for the unemployment rate to get to 20 or 30% in the depression. And we did it in three weeks. Yeah, I mean, what, every, what everything's, happened, everything's happened faster in this crisis because of yeah. the nature of the crisis. It's not, this is not uh, a garden variety downturn. This is the world economy coming to a screeching stop. And so we're going to see this, not just in the weekly initial jobless claims, but next Friday, that'd be, uh, uh, what is it? That's May 8th. Uh, that we're going to get the uh, April non-farm payrolls from the U.S. And the early estimate is for a, a loss of 21 million jobs. Yeah, so, of course, this is, this is different than a typical recession. Now, I was in that camp that thought that the economy was weakening. You know, before we got into this crisis, this is the longest expansion in American history. It's been longest, and I thought it was becoming increasingly fragile for some of those shocks uh, that, you know, that we all know about, like the tariffs like the changing yeah. policy mix. And so I was concerned that we were headed for a recession in any event. Before but this really pushes catalyst. over. Okay. Excuse, and and let, me, let me just show you uh, one more chart here, if I can, uh, I can uh, this here. Oh, you're getting the hang of it now, buddy. I'm trying to here. I'm, I'm a little slow. This, Great I'm presentation. I'm a little boomer, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, so I want to show you this one, because this is another actionable one. Uh, immediately actionable, I think, or something to be watching very closely in the next couple of days. So this is the British pound, and where the Aussie crashed, so did the sterling. Sterling did not belong at 115, not March. But the sell-off took place. You saw the nice base, had the nice bounce. And now look at this. To me, this is a head and shoulders pattern, potential head and shoulders pattern. So you've got the left shoulder head, Right shoulder, yesterday, we got right above 125 shoulder. Very symmetrical. Very nicely done. And then we've got the neckline around 123. So for me, the, so again, I have this macro view uh, that, the, uh, that there still is a dollar shortage out there and that the, uh, that the, dollar, that the uh, sterling and other currencies had a bounce like the Aussie. And now I'm looking for this bounce to either correct lower to your point, Dale, or to be to retest those lows. And so I'm looking for these reversal patterns. In the Aussie, I'm looking for just a day pattern to tell me it's okay to sell it. Here, I'm looking for the breakdown of this head and shoulders pattern. Nice look. And so, uh, okay. so, yeah, so, so those are the charts I really have for you. I, I think okay. that the, uh, 
uh, I guess my, my other point, just broadly speaking, is that the, uh, I, and, and this is what I, what, I, what I wrote about in my second book called Political Economy of Tomorrow. I think that our challenges are not so much from capitalism's weakness and uh, uh, the excesses, the, the weaknesses that it generates, the, uh, say, danger to the environment or uh, disparity of wealth and income. Those are all problems, but they can all be fixed. To me, the, the hardest problems really come out of the success of capitalism. It's sort of like maybe some people we know, that their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness. And I think that's true about capitalism. Uh, and so in, in my book, I really talk about the possibility that the way to characterize or the way to frame what we're going through modern era is really like a Midas, King Midas story. Remember King Midas from Greek mythology? Yeah. Yeah. Everything he touched turned to gold. At first, it was, at first, it was a gift. He touched a tree, turned to gold. A piece of fruit turned to gold. And then he tried to drink some wine and hug his daughter. And I think that's where we are. We're seeing the downside of the incredible success that capitalism brings us, where even poor people among us, living longer, having more material things than ever before. And so what concerns me really then is in this Midas moment, is, is not that there, for me, the Midas moment is at this, the heart of the problem and why interest rates are low. It's not simply because the central bank is buying them. In fact, if the Federal Reserve stopped buying treasuries, I think yields would actually fall further because what would happen if the Federal Reserve stood back and let the economy do what it will do, which might stay in a trough and not recover, interest rates would go down further. And I'm worried that the problem we have is really generated from too much of a good thing. And, you know, in Brazil, they found this. Uh, when Lula became the president, he thought that his country suffered from the lack of food. He found out it didn't, that more people had, had nutrition problems but had overweight problems than were, than were starving. And I think this just uh, illustrates the, a general problem that I think is in the world, especially in the major industrialized countries. We have too much. And the reason, it's sort of like there's a story about a, uh, a guy who's taking his uh, motorcycle. He's riding his motorcycle in China. And he is, uh, has, a, has a half a pig he's bringing back to his family. And they, he gets hijacked. And they let him keep the motorcycle. <laughs> pork was more, was more valuable. And the idea is that we know when pork prices go up, we know why. Like right now in the U.S., there's a, all of a sudden, there's some disruption of supply. In uh, China, they had a call from the Asian uh, swine flu. In the U.S., it, the meat processors have shut down. We know that the supply and demand works for commodities. Oil prices, a great example. What about money? And I think that because we live in a capitalist society, many of us don't, many of us put a, this, uh, think about capital as a special thing. That, it's, that you can have too much of anything, but you, you can't have too much money. But collectively, we have so much money, and I think that is why interest rates have fallen. Interest rates stay low for various reasons, but among them that I think is under underappreciated is that there's just too much money. And I know people say, well, what about all this debt? Well, your debt, one person's debt is another person's asset. And so too much debt and too much capital, they really work hand in hand. So let me stop so, there, Dan. I know you, you must be uh, no, eager so to ask So what are the questions. repercussions of having too much? Mark, where are we going? Because the title of your presentation was the end of economic primacy. So uh, is it possible that because we've reached this Midas moment, we're going to abandon capitalism and move either real far left or real far right? Yeah, you know, you know Dave, I find this so, uh, so interesting that like I see this uh, Every time we get a downturn, every time the central bank does something, people announce this is the end of laissez-faire, the end of right. capitalism. Keynes wrote the end of laissez-faire in the 1920s. I'm not sure like what people think about capitalism or what's ending, but just think about the size of the federal government. In the U.S., the federal government consumes a third of GDP. In Europe, it's closer to 50% of GDP. That is to say, modern economies do not generate sufficient aggregate demand and the government step in. I can't think of a, uh, I, 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 I don't think that this, whole, this, uh, this like Garden of Eden was up only up to the markets. I don't think that ever existed. But so I, my, my point about the end of economic primacy is I think that uh, the great financial crisis ended the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, if you will, 
a real pull, a real push of liberalization, capital markets, uh, even think about the securitization. It was really an explosion of economic liberty. And I think that the end of that financial crisis began a new era. And that new era, I think, is uh, the this coronavirus. I think there's a question I think a lot of people have. Will the coronavirus change the trajectory or will it, will it accelerate forces that are already at work? And I think for me, the, the end of economic primacy was already in the works before. You think about, uh, it's not just in the United States either, but of course, President Trump illustrates or brings a lot of those factors together, uh, economic nationalism, national security. This is what's going to happen to, say right now, for example, the U.S. does not make any antibiotics. I think we lost our last penicillin factory about four or five years ago. So what's going to happen on the other side of this, this crisis is we're going to be onshoring, re, right. reshoring, if you will, medical profession. That is medical research, uh, making antibiotics, making drugs, making medicines, making medical products. Same thing that China is going to face. China is, is, a, is really reliant, like many countries are, on a U.S. duopoly, OIS and Android. And I think that it's not in their interest, not in other countries' interest, to be that dependent. So they have to develop their own. I see this uh, privacy rules in Europe beginning to break down the one, sort of the one web into different components. I think that's, that's increasingly what's going to happen. I think that the environmentalists are going to tell us that, that we need to, we, just because it's cheap to drill shale oil in the U.S. doesn't mean we should do it. New York State, for example, has shale formation, but the people in the state said, no, we don't want shale drilling in New York. And so I think that the economic efficiency those arguments are going to have to get more balanced. And I think this changes the direction of globalization. I think we still will have trade, but I think that it, it, it changes the globalization. But these forces, I think, were already in play before the crisis. Europe, for example, passing rules so that the Chinese state-owned companies don't buy up their companies, especially at this big discount that's recently been given. So I think that this is uh, long-term forces, and I think that uh, we'll have... Uh, uh, perhaps less trade and less economic efficiency type of arguments. Instead, we'll look at things like national security. We want to be secure in energy. We want to be secure in food. And now we've learned we want to be secure in medicine, medical products. What a great presentation. Once again, you know, Mark, um, I have a tendency to be um, a bit emotional about big changes and shocks uh, that are happening in front of my eyes. And you know what? You're better than a Valium. <laughs> okay, because you can put everything into context that it's just the evolution of things and it really isn't the end of our way of life because the government stepping in to do this is just another transition that will lead to another transition and another transition. Am I reading you correctly? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that the, uh, that, that the relationship between the state, uh, the economy, investors or citizens. This is, these are the three key relationships. And I think that they do morph. And uh, uh, I'm not a purist. Uh, this is a mixed, a mixed event, mixed, uh, just like I try to combine technicals and fundamentals. I think we got to combine, combine politics, economics. And uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, but I do think that, you know, uh, maybe as a, uh, to leave on an up note is, uh, you know, we had that uh, uh, first quarter GDP this morning is horrible. The only thing we could really know about it it's going to be worse in Q2. But my, my, uh, my optimistic note here, besides being a Cubs fan and knowing that there's always next year, <laughs> is, that the, is that the economy are likely to be bottoming out here in, well, at the beginning of, sometime in May. So say next month, uh, the economy is going to be bottoming. We're not going to go back to this kind of situation again, uh, that the contraction is the steepest as uh, now. And I think that... Uh, uh, it's not going to be uh, like the V-shaped recovery or anything like that, but just the math of a GDP, because we're, lo we're looking at the difference of the difference, the change in the change. And so I think Q3 will be a lot better, and that we're just, like I say, we're, the economies are bottoming uh, in the next few weeks. Mark, thank you so much for being here. Everyone, you can follow Mark on Twitter at Mark Making Sense, And uh, the name of your blog again, Mark, same thing is uh, Mark to Market. It's uh, Mark to Market. Mark to Market. Mark with a C to make my mom happy. Okay, Mark. Thank you so much, my trading warrior brother. Thank you. Good Appreciate luck to everybody. Thank you, yeah, Mark. good hunting to you too, Mark. Thank you so much for being part of the summit.